Wow. Did you know you could set your soul free for just $30,000? You can handle this. You can get a Mercedes. You could be somebody. I mean, for most of us, this really isn't a temptation. Um, we can see through the thin veneer of that kind of advertising, and we know that never is life really that simple. Uh, we know that we can't buy soul happiness, and, and yet we know that every day in hundreds of ways that we make little choices that determine uh, our path. And I know that that's kind of dramatic. You know, the preacher's telling you, oh, you're making these little choices. It's going to determine all of your life and everything. But it's really true, isn't it? it I, you know, you stop and think about it. It's not one big choice usually. I mean, that's what we try to, to say is it's one big choice in life. And from then, you know, it's all set. It's not. Even after you make that one choice for Christ, there's millions of little choices, millions of little temptations that we face all the time, constantly tempted. We travel through Lent this year, and, and hopefully we're uh, fasting and becoming increasingly aware of our need for um, real, a real living encounter with, with God and a continuing daily dependence. And We've considered the temptation of the appetite and the temptation of ambition. And today we have the third of the temptations, affirmation. And we see that affirmation is really a very close relative to last week's ambition. And we remember once again that I've reminded you every week that after Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, he heard that voice that says, This is my son and him I'm well pleased. And then the Spirit led him out into the desert where he was tempted for 40 days. And this, um, this is the last of the temptations, and um, it's the huge one. The third is our subject today. Matthew 4, 8 to 11. It says, Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I'll give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, Go away, Satan, because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. The devil left him and angels came and took care of him. Now, the, the previous temptation last week was staged on the top of the temple and Jesus is now taken to the top of a mountain where He's shown all the kingdoms of the world and all of the power, all the glory, the prestige, you know, all the wealth, the praise of the world is shown to Him. And He is... Remember, on earth, just a common carpenter's son. Uh, he was, uh, Isaiah told us from Isaiah 53, uh, Isaiah said that he had no stately form. He was a very common looking man, common looking man. No one said, Oh, isn't he a nice looking guy? He's so charismatic, this, this Messiah. That wasn't him. In fact, at, at this era, uh, your bloodline was the most important thing about you whose kids you were. And Jesus was born to a real no-name couple, and he had, remember, kind of a rough beginning, kid born in a barn to a mother who they said uh, said he was really illegitimate. And uh, his mother said, well, he's God's son. And everybody said, snicker, snicker. Yeah, sure. You know, that was his bloodline. And now uh, the, this once majestic angel, this once beautiful angel, called Satan, uh, tempts him with, with this. He says, well, um, Jesus, just, just this once, uh, I want to give you another alternative. If you would just bow down uh, just one time, uh, you could have all of it now, everything that you see. You don't need to go that other path that you've been told. Uh, there's no need for your followers to go through all this pain. All that's unnecessary. You see, and no reason for your mother to have to suffer this loss. Think of your mother, Jesus. Think of your family. Think of your followers and what they think of you. We, we can settle this thing right now. Nobody else is going to see. It's just you and me. You just need to bow down. You don't, I don't need to mean it. Just do it, you know. As a matter of fact, Jesus, you see, um, God has provided me in this other way, this other avenue. For you to do this, this is really a much better plan than the other way. Do you feel the depth of that temptation? I, I, I don't know. To, 
I admit it's probably a little bit beyond what we can imagine or accept. Ruler of the world? <laughs> this is what he's being offered with, ruler of the world. Have you ever been tempted with being ruler of the world? No, that's probably a little bit beyond us, isn't it? You know, Had Satan offered him a life without pain, a life without suffering, a, a life without stress? You might say, well, so I'll never get sick. I'll, I'll never be anxious. Uh, people always say nice things about me. Yeah. I say, well, maybe I can relate to that a little bit, but kingdoms of the world, ruler of the known world, probably kind of over our heads. The writer of the Hebrews would later, uh, no doubt, consider this moment and say uh, of the power of Jesus in this midst of temptation, Hebrews 4.15 he said, because we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but instead one who was tempted in every way that we are, except without sin. Tempted with everything. He was tempted in all the things, and yet without sin. I mean, what, what is hunger for bread in the first temptation compared to this? What is, you know, jump off the circus trick, jump off the top of the temple compared to this? compared to ruler of the world. I think this is the big temptation. And, and think about this. Jesus knew that he was facing death at the hands of some of the most cruel men in the world. You know, if you've ever seen uh, The Passion of the Christ, that movie, oh my, that really drove home the point. And I think that this is accurate, that the Roman soldiers who took Jesus and tortured him enjoyed it immensely. They enjoyed killing people. Wow. They, they did it a lot. They put a robe on him. They put a crown of thorns on, him, on his head. They gave him a, a reed as a scepter. And they said, oh, hail, king of the Jews. They mocked him. Nobody opposed that. Nobody said, oh, now, wait a minute. What are you doing to him? Not one person. Everybody ran. He was totally rejected. Didn't receive the affirmation of his family and friends. They all deserted him. No one said, oh, Jesus, keep on going. You're doing it for us. We know that it hurts, but, but it's worth it, Jesus. You can do it. No one said that. They're all gone. You know what they said? They said, gosh, we thought he was the Messiah. Man, we had hoped that he was the guy, but we were wrong. Talk about lack of affirmation and rejection. They didn't even appreciate what he was doing for them. When he did it. Later on, or earlier, excuse me, later on after this temptation, uh, Jesus said, watch out when everyone says good things about you. But there could have been a few that said something good about him during this. The only ones were a few women and John at the cross. And they were not approving of what he was doing. They They just wouldn't give up. But they... They didn't think that what he was doing was the right path. He did not have the affirmation of anyone, just one. There's just, just one person who approved of what he was doing, and that was his father, just one. He knew that no one would affirm his life, and who was he and who he was. Just one person would affirm and still he looked at all the kingdoms of, those, of this world, at this other alternate path, and he says, no, I'm going to worship God alone, serve Him alone. He lived and he died for an audience of one. Did you ever think about that? The depth of rejection that he went through. Later in life, Jesus said, Matthew 16, 26, he said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And we hear soul and we think eternal life. I don't really think that's what he's saying here. Other translations will say, What will it profit a man if he, uh, if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? In other words, what are you willing to exchange Okay, for, for life, real abundant life. Jesus knew because he had been offered the world in exchange for his soul. And since then, the temptation has been the subject of many legends, just like the Mercedes commercial. 
You know, we have the German Faustian legends and, and we have, I thought of Charlie Daniels and the devil goes down to Georgia. I don't know if anybody remembers that good song, but same kind of thing. See, they're making a deal with the devil. And for the most part, the subject of making a deal with the devil is a subject of jokes is what it is. We laugh about it, trading your soul to the devil, but the temptation is relevant and it's real. It's not dramatic. It's not on the scale of ruler of the whole world. Instead, it's just this slow, gradual, very ordinary settling, I think. We're tempted with daily trading our our God identity away for the affirmation, just a little bit of approval. And it struck me that, that Jesus knew something that we certainly uh, don't remember if we do know it. We are very hungry for approval. Uh, our world uh, now just waits for the latest poll to find out what we believe. Millions and millions, well, no, billions and billions of dollars are spent by marketing agencies and political agencies to poll America. Every day there's a new poll to find out what people believe so you will know what to think. I mean, that's the sum of the matter. So if you're uh, against gun control and a new poll is taken and says, well, well, it's kind of shifted here. Uh, About 55% of Americans now are for gun control. All of a sudden, I'm for gun control, right? Because I want to continue to get elected or I want to sell them something. It's strange how we look to what the majority is in our nation in order to decide what we believe, what's real to us. And we all do it some. I mean, I don't want to be a weirdo. I don't want to be the only guy that thinks this. You know, um, I want to be in the mainstream. We all want to be in the mainstream. We, We desire that approval and affirmation of others. They do affect us. But what affects us even more, I think, is our need for approval of those who are close to us, who are not... Who is not shattered when, when uh, those around us reject us? Um, in fact, rejection is the opposite of affirmation. And, and rejection just gets to every one of us. I, I want people to like me. That's a normal thing to want people to like you. I mean, just who doesn't want people to like them? I mean, that's just, that, that really is weird. We, we, we want people to, to affirm us and to say, you're doing okay. You're all right, man. You, you're doing well. I need that. And most of the time that's, that's not a big thing, but we are warned that if we, we seek just the approval of others, it can become our idol. It can become the center of our life. And everything we think about passes through that. According to a, a study two years ago, 2011, in USA Today, sex, booze, or money just can't compare with a jolt of self-esteem. Brad Bushman Uh, said, we looked at all things in college students that they love, and they love self-esteem more. We're always picking on college students, aren't we? We really shouldn't do that. Probably could take that of 30-year-olds, right? Definitely not 60-year-olds, but 30-year-olds and probably get probably the same data. Anyway, the researchers used two separate studies of 282 students in Ohio, New York. Well, that might explain this too, that that measure the students' desire. Sorry, uh, Ohioans and New Yorkans measure the student's desire for a number of goals. Receiving praise, engaging in sex, drinking alcohol, getting a paycheck, eating their favorite food, or seeing their best friend. They chose, number one, receiving the praise. It was more important than all those other things. Of course, this is what we say. Uh, It's different maybe what we do. But speaking of the successive need to be praised, researcher Concluded, he says, in general, I think self-esteem, though it feels good for the individual, is harmful to society, especially if it goes over the top and becomes narcissism. I want to show you a little something. You've probably seen this before.
I, I thought we needed a little relief in the middle of this, so I'll show you a cartoon. The culture of the Sneetches is no different, you know, than, uh, than any culture, and that's why it's funny, and it's kind of edgy, our culture, which is the kingdom of this world, worships at the throne, of course, of public opinion and affirmation. Approval, our need for affirmation, acceptance can be an idol. The thing we worship and what takes the place of God. And we know that approval is our idol if our greatest nightmare is rejection. Now here's what we need to know about idols and our idols. The idol that we love, it doesn't love us back. We, we give our lives to something. We think it should treat us well, but uh, false gods don't love us. Um, idols don't keep their promises. Anything that we worship and, and build our lives on other than God will just suck the life out of us and destroy us. Americans think freedom is found in casting out all restraint and all restrictions and being masters of our own destinies. And what we're blind to is the reality that Everybody has a master. We all worship at the throne of something. Something. Whether we worship, whatever we worship is our master. Idols make bad masters. Idols enslave us. And until we identify the idols in our lives, we, we will feel enslaved and unhappy and, and tired. And remember that there's only one who promised real freedom. And he said, I have come to set the captives free. Only he can give freedom. God's affirmation is really all that really matters. We are um, cap not capable of meeting the temptations to be approved and affirmed by others at all costs unless we've really received our identity in God. Th this is what I really want us to hear today. Notice that in this account of the temptation of Jesus, when he was baptized... Okay, he goes down into the water and he comes up and God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hasn't done anything. God gives the affirmation to him before his ministry even begins. You see, the love of the father is upon him. The affirmation is upon him from the beginning, not after he has fulfilled what he was supposed to do. God's not waiting for us to, to clean up our mouth, to clean up our act, to get things straight. And then he'll say, well, now that you've become pretty good, now I love you. This is just core stuff. And it's stuff that we, you know, need to be reminded of over and over. So many Christians miss this. So many Christians miss this affirmation of God. The reality is so different, so foreign to the, the kingdoms of this world that I think it's difficult for us to accept it. It's difficult for us to, to, for it to soak into our lives. The kingdoms of this world say, oh, do the best that you can. Change a few things. Become better than about half the people. Okay? You, you don't want to be a bad person, but be a pretty good person. Clean up your life. Become a better person than most people. And do what you don't really want to do sometimes, you know, make some sacrifices and win the approval and the affirmation of other people. And then I might love you until you do something bad again. And then I'm not going to love you as much and you're going to have to start all over. It's, it's funny how Christians even come into the church and we think that this is the message that we're receiving, that I have to become a good person. That's the kingdom of Satan. That, that was the kingdom that he was trying to sell Jesus. He says, bow down to me. You know, live like this, and I'm going to cut you a deal. I'll give you some things. And God says, I love you so much that I'll give my own son, see. There, there's the core of it. That reality is deep in Jesus. Uh, Jesus knew that he was the son of God. He had God's approval. He had God's affirmation. It, it's not based on, on what he didn't do or what he would do, but he received the affirmation on the love of God, period. And it's important for us to, to grasp and receive that affirmation, to know that God loves us, not because we become a good person, but realize that when we receive God's love for us, we receive that affirmation that then we become a good person. 
It's just exactly the other way around. God gives His affirmation, His approval first. Romans 8, 15 to 16 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption of sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We cry out, Daddy. We cry out, Father. We receive the affirmation from God, not based on our actions, but based on His love for us. And with that knowledge, that identity, we're set free then from the need to live for the approval of others. J.I. Packer said, if, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. This is what it comes back to. Are we a child of God? Do I get that? Amen. Jesse Rice wrote uh, in his blog a letter when he broke up with uh, an imaginary person he calls fear of what others think. Listen to this. Dear fear of what others think, I'm sick of you and it's time we broke up. I know we've broken up and gotten back together many times, but seriously, fear of what others think, this is it. We're breaking up. I'm tired of overthinking my status updates on Facebook, trying to sound more clever, funny, and important. I'm sick of feeling anxious about what I say or do in public, especially around people I don't know that well, all in the hope that they'll like me, accept me, praise me. I run around all day feeling like a golden retriever with a full bladder. Like me, like me, like me. Because of you, I go through my day with a cloud of shame hanging over my head, and I never stop acting. The spotlight's always on, and I'm center stage, and I'd I'd better keep dancing and, and posturing and mugging, or else the spotlight will move, and I'll dissolve into a little meaningless puddle on the ground, just like that witch in The Wizard of Oz. I can never live up to the expectations of my imaginary audience. Wow, there's a line. I can never live up to the expectations of my imaginary audience, the one that lives only in my head, but whose collective voice is louder than any other voice in the universe. And all of this is especially evil because if I really stop and think about it and let things go quiet and listen patiently for the voice of God who made me and the Savior who died for me in His eyes, it turns out I'm actually profoundly precious lovable, worthy, valuable, and even just a little ghetto fabulous. When I find my true identity in Christ, then you turn back into the tiny yapping little dog you are. So eat it, fear of what others think. You and I are done. And no, I'm not interested in talking it through. I'm running, jumping, laughing you out of my life once and for all, or at least that's what I really, really want. God help me. You identify with that? I did. I, You know, I want to break up with the kingdoms of this world that keep telling me that I'm nothing unless I'm in agreement with someone else in the most recent poll or unless I'm funny and relevant and smart and all these things. My identity comes from God. Your identity comes from God. First and foremost, you are a child of God regardless what other people say. And God says, find yourself in me. Die to your need to be approved and affirmed. He says, I'll never reject you. Come live in me. I think for too long, we have called unbelievers to invite Jesus into your life. I've done that for years. You need to invite Jesus into your life. I'm looking at this differently right now. Jesus doesn't want to come into my life. My life's all screwed up. Why would Jesus want to come into my life? We need to get into Jesus' life. See the difference there? We want Him to come in and tweak us just a little bit. And He says, no, find your identity in me. Who you really are is a child of God. Forget about the kingdoms of the world. Don't bow down to them. Don't worry about what they do. 
Listen to me. Your true identity is in God. No one else can give us the uh, approval, the affirmation that you need but God. Are you with me here? 